Okay, hi everybody. My name is Alpi Mainville. I'm the um, Athlete Development Director for the OVA. And in today's session, we're going to keep going in um, our, um, you know, we're going to keep diving in a little bit deeper into our early contact streams, seasonal plans and processes to help us um, coaches, um, you know, train our athletes. And today we're going to uh, really look at the specifics of a practice plan. And what we're going to do is that, that we are going to uh, develop a practice plan together for the um, for a 4v4 rally ball team okay so we're going to start from the 4v4 seasonal plan and then we're going to design a practice for one of the sessions all right so pretty straightforward the objective of this session is to kind of give you an idea of the process of using a seasonal plan to then you know take the information there and put this information into a practice plan that you can implement with your team uh, I also want to show you a little bit of my process of how I approach it. And perhaps it gives you a little bit of uh, some tips, I guess, on how to um, make your planning process a bit more effective when it comes to uh, planning practices. Okay. And not just planning any kind of practices, but planning practices that all eventually align with each other. Okay. So this is the first time that I do this. So I won't lie. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm hoping that the technology I'm using is going to work out. And if not, then we'll just find some solutions and adapt. Okay. So I'm going to get going, share my screen, and we'll, uh, we'll get started here. Okay. So uh, this is our uh, seasonal plan. This is the plan that we're going to use. So um, we have here the Rally Ball 4v4 Boys season plan. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Um, we're going to we're going to we're going to use this. Okay. Uh, before we get into the season plan itself, I will show you the practice plan template that we're going to use for today. Because once you have your season plan, you want to find yourself a practice plan that's going to work for you, that has all the information that you need and that you're gonna find simple um, to complete when you're, when you're planning your, your, uh, your practices. So for me, I like this one here. Uh, it's hidden behind this window. Okay, I like this format right here. Let me move this out of the way. All right, so very simple, right? I've got uh, the information about the session right here at the top. Uh, I'm going to highlight the priority skill, um, list the objectives for the session. And then here on the right, I can essentially write down any type of notes, messages that I want to make to the team, that type, of, that, that type of stuff, okay? So very simple here, but at least it allows me, if I go back, well, I know, you know when I ran that session, what the objectives were and so on, all right? And then I have a bunch of little uh, drill plan uh, templates. All right, so very simple. We're gonna want to write down, you know, kind of the name of our drill or a quick one-liner to describe the drill. Uh, very important box here, which is the one where uh, we are going to um, identify the objective. Okay, so what are we trying to accomplish with this drill and how does it fit with our session objective? So this box is gonna be very important. Okay, um, obviously here we're going to draw out our drill. We're going to identify the skills that, we're, that we work on, and those are gonna be tied to our purpose. Same thing here with the key cues and decisions, right? So when we train our athletes in volleyball, um, we're not just trying to get them to execute the movement. We want them to use their eyes, we want them to use their brains, we want them to understand the game and how um, the different interactions between the players, the ball, the net, their position in space and all that stuff. How does that impact their ability to execute the skill? So we're gonna talk a little bit about this. And then we have um, you know, very simple uh, description of the drill. Execution criteria is gonna be kind of um, how many reps or how many successful attempts, how long will the drill be in terms of you know, how do we move on from this drill to another one. Uh, key teaching points is going to be what we want 
the athletes to learn and to retain out of our drill. And, and at the end here, uh, this is something that, um, this section here, something that uh, I remember taking from a drill plan template when I did my level three. I believe it came from the national team. And um, I really like this box because it kind of allows you to write down any uh, other thing, you know, in terms of like psychological or physical skills that you want to include as part of your as part of your drill, just to kind of keep track of things. So whether you want to add uh, an agility piece to it, whether you want to, uh, you know, focus, and we'll see in this session at some point um, on communication or any other skills that are not like a technical skills, but you still kind of want to address with your athletes, you can write down um, that, you can write that down in your, in your drill plan. So we have a bunch of those and we're gonna complete um, as many as we need to do our practice. Okay, so that's the plan that we're going to use. This plan is ad adapted from the NCCP Development Coach Workshop Plan that uh, some of you may have to or have completed when you did your evaluation for the um, Development Coach uh, certification. And so that's why it may seem familiar to some of you, but I have adapted it to make it uh, a little bit more uh, simple for kind of what I needed. Uh, for, for what I need in terms of planning this practice here, all right? So once I have my a drill template and practice plan template, it's time to start completing it, okay? Before I complete it, um, I need to know what team I'm working with, right? So that's the first section here. So, okay, here's a piece of technology that I need to work around, all right? So I'm just going to grab this here, all right? Uh, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big pen and paper person, I usually never um, um, fill out a practice plan on a computer. It's very rare. I, I like to write it down. I feel it's a lot faster, but obviously for the purpose of this, um, I'm going to be doing it on a, on a computer. So please bear with me. So we're going to pretend this is the Timo 12U team, although there's no such thing. Um, we're just going to call it Timo. Uh, we're going to need to know how many players we have. And for this, I think it would be appropriate to just go through a practice um, with 12 players because most teams will have you know, 12 players uh, for, um, for four on four rally ball. It's very likely that you're going to train with 12 players, but then split your roster into two teams to attend the event, right? So that you have two teams of six and the kids are getting a lot of play time. And uh, that's fine, but that's what we're gonna do here. Okay, now we need a week, our date and length of session. So that's where we're going to start using our uh, seasonal plan here. And uh, for this um, this practice plan, I've decided to choose week eight uh, because it's a little further in our season. And also because there's an event here and I wanted to be able to discuss kind of what may or may not be important when you do have an event um, during the week, okay, or at the end of your week. So I've selected this this week, and I'm going to want to go down and look at everything that I'm doing this week. So I know that I want to plan. A, I'm planning a practice for this week, and we're going to pretend that it's Tuesday, and I'm planning a practice for the next day, which is the Wednesday. We had our Monday night practice last night, and now I need to plan for Wednesday, right? So I'm gonna look at what's in my practice plan. Well, I know that my session is gonna be an hour and a half. All right, so for my Wednesday here, I've got an hour of training and about half an hour of um, competition that I'm gonna do as part of my practice. And that's probably because I have an event on a weekend. Because if you look at the rest of the weeks, I didn't always have competition uh, in practice uh, in my previous weeks. I had some leading to this first event, one week without it, and now a couple of weeks with it leading to this event, all right? So that's something that I need to know as I'm gonna plan my practice, all right? So an hour and a half, let's put that in. We're gonna go nine men. And we already said that we were gonna do, oops, that's not what I wanna do. Uh, All right, sorry for that. 
so week eight and date. Well, we're a week of uh, November 22nd, that's a Monday. So that's gonna be November 24th. All right, I'll put it in here. Okay, so now I need to complete this. What am I gonna be working on? And this is the piece that I really like about the season plan because now that I've identified where I am in my season, I can look at everything that is that I had planned during that week. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to know is that, okay, I do have an event coming up in a couple of days. So I'm gonna to have to keep that in mind as I plan my practice. Uh, is there something else? I don't see anything else, okay? So there could have been some team building or some um, fundraising or whatever else during that week, but I don't see anything here. So there's nothing else for me to uh, worry about, no physical testing. So that's great. I can just focus on what I'm gonna do during my session on the court. So now I'm gonna look down and look at the orange because I'm planning for Wednesday, which is my orange color, my day two. So during the week of November 22nd, my priority skill is setting. Awesome, right? So I've been working on a different skill at each practice for each of the weeks so far. And now it's time for us to start addressing setting again. We did it a couple of times before and uh, we're doing it on that Wednesday. Okay, so I know that's gonna be my priority drill. I'm gonna go here and essentially um, highlight it. I'm just gonna go here. Oh, just moved. So if I take this, there I go. Setting, just highlighted it. Great. I'm good here. Okay, so setting, perfect. Now, the next thing I'm gonna to wanna to know is, um, okay, for setting, what is it that I'm gonna work on? So I haven't done that here, but you know, if I was really detailed, uh, I would have already planned within all of my weeks, my seasonal plan, what teaching points I was going to, I was going to address. We talked about this in this session on a seasonal plan. We have a tab here with a list of teaching points by skill that, uh, you know, with some that we recommend you use and some spaces here for you to actually insert your own teaching points. All right. So I'm just going to make this up now, but perhaps uh, today for this Wednesday, my um, teaching points because of us working on stuff before was going to be um, square to target. Okay, let's just do this. Let's just go uh, square to target and arm and leg extension. Okay, so those were going to be our, our teaching points that we're going to focus on in this uh, in this session. Great. Okay, so A and C. So I'm just going to go back and then write it down here. Pretend I was there. So that's going to help us guide what we're going to do with um, our practice, right? Now, not only do we know we're going to work on setting, but this is what we're going to work on here. Uh, these these two teaching points are going to be the main thing. Okay, so I'm going to go back and write this down. All right, so now I know that we're going to work on um, scoring to target and using our arms and legs to push the ball um, to the outside. Awesome. So I'm going to put a little text box here, and I'm going to write a couple of objectives to the seat for the session. It doesn't have to be very long. Because I know my priority skill is setting, I'm going to write that, um, let's say, the objective of the session is going to be to improve, um, let's say, improve uh, setting okay, to both pins. Okay, we're getting ready for a tournament, so we're probably going to want to practice setting both sides, uh, improve setting to both pins, and also, um, let's put this. We have, oh yeah. So the other thing that I wanna know, okay? And I'll get this, I'll get to this uh, a little bit later, but I wanna mention it now because I think we need to write in our objectives. Um, if you look down, if I go all the way down to here and I start looking at my systems and tactical objectives, all right, you'll notice that um, we're kind of like halfway through to getting to, um, you know, setting front and back sets here, right? So here, if I look at setter position, we're playing in our 4-1-4 with a setter in position three. 
and we are asking our players to set in front of them. Okay, so they're going to fast position four when they set the four, and we're going to face position two when they set to two, right? So that's good to know. Um, now, I'm probably a little too far um, away from this here to start working on back sets. Plus, I have a tournament this weekend, so maybe not the best idea to start introducing a skill that we're not really going to use, you know, a couple of days before the event. So I'm going to avoid working on back sets, but maybe I can put something in there uh, related to facing, um, you know, where we set. Now, I know that we've talked about squaring, but if we're going to talk about curating and decision-making, maybe we can put something in there that's related to that, okay? So really important to take a look at this, okay? especially if there's a system or tactical objective that's related to the skill you work on. Right. So in this case, there is. So I'm going to go improve setting double pins. Um, let me just get back in there. And I'm going to um, go here and then just write as well, trying to be a bit more detailed. Um, improve getting squared to target and using arms and legs to push, uh, to push the ball just in here. And then I'm probably gonna want to, let me see if I can put this to the right. No, I'll pick it here. Okay. The thing. Oh. Oh, okay. Let me, let me it's not letting me write. Great. See? Maybe there's going to be some technology problems. Oh, that's working well. There's no like in it. Okay. Anyways, let's just pretend that uh, that I'm writing this. So um, improve setting about both pins, improve getting square to target and using arms and legs to push the ball. And then uh, in terms of like cue reading and decision-making, I would probably add something such as um, recognize situations um, in which I'm setting to four and setting to two, okay? Just something about like, hey, we're gonna try to get better at recognizing what's the best situation where we should set to four and two and how we're gonna move our body to get that achieved, all right? So now that we know this, let's get into our, our drill planning. But, um, and, and what we're gonna do to do this, we're just gonna go back and look at everything else in our seasonal plan to make sure we're not forgetting anything, okay? So things we're gonna wanna keep, um, keep in mind, right? So first thing that we know is that we have an event on the weekend, right? So we're gonna wanna be mindful about the volume, right? So that we don't get our athletes too tired, perhaps before the event, uh, but we're also gonna wanna make sure that um, our athletes are ready to go, okay? So what do we do for the rest of that week, right? So let's go back to the Monday because it's important to know what we did on the Monday uh, because we wanna consider the entire week, okay? So on Monday, I look back to the blue here, we did some passing. So we did some passing and we probably did some serving as well to practice our passing. So, okay, that means we probably don't need to put too much emphasis on serve and pass today because we've done some, um, but maybe we include um, a couple of minutes of serving just because we know that at that age, uh, it's an important skill to kind of uh, prepare for, especially, especially just before an event, okay? But at least I know that we've done um, some passing and very likely some serving as well. That's great. Uh, we didn't do some attacking, but we did some last week <coughs> on the Monday. So, I want to make sure that um, you know once we get into gameplay that we have lots of opportunities to attack and get ready for a, for a game. Now I'm going to look here at our physical skills priority by week, and I know that I do uh, this here on the Monday. This is when we have our uh, physical training. So on Monday we did some agility and coordination, which is great. We don't have any today, other than including some speed work at the end of our warm up. So perfect. Um, over here, 
I'm looking at this, I should know because it's been the same, you know, since the beginning of the season. So at that point, you may not necessarily be looking at this because you know already kind of what your systems are going to be, right? In terms of, um, you know, your passing formation and then also your blocking stuff, right? The only other thing that I kind of want to know again, and again, this you should know since the beginning, but in this case, I want to mention it, is you would know about the psychological skills that you want to work on, um, you know, in your practices on a daily basis, right? So what we're going to do and be mindful of as we plan a practice is perhaps including some pieces of this um, that's going to help our players develop those skills right here. Okay, so self-awareness, self-evaluation, communication, and mindfulness, right? So I'll show you a couple of ways that we can do that once we get into the, the session, all right? So once I know all of this, let's get, let's get planning. So the first thing that we need is a little warm-up. And for my warm up, because I know I'm going to be doing some setting, I want to make sure that, um, you know, the athletes will be ready to perform the skill that's a priority. Now, setting is not necessarily a skill that requires like a very specific warm up, such as, uh, you know, as opposed to perhaps uh, attacking, where you need to make sure that you're ready to jump and that you're also warm up your shoulder really good. Setting requires more of a kind of generic. Uh, warm up, but um, we definitely want to keep in mind the fact that we're going to end up hitting at the end of the, the session. So probably good to get the shoulder going. All right. Another thing is because we have very lim limited time, we only have 90 minutes. I'm going to want to make sure that I combine in my warm up all aspects of my warm up. So I'm going to want to have a ball involved in my warm up uh, game, and I'm going to want to have a um, component of uh, stretch and dynamic stretch probably uh, in there so that I can combine everything, get it done quick so that we can move on into the next portion of my practice, All right? So um, I can't see you guys, but I'm wondering if anyone would like to suggest a warm up activity that would achieve all of this, that would achieve us getting warm, uh, playing with the ball and also getting some stretches stretches in. Any ideas? If no, that's okay. I have an idea. <laughs> that's why I'm here. So what we're going to do for the warm up, because I want the athletes to do all of this, is we're going to do a little um, Smash ball, smash ball, king squirt. Okay. So, with dynamic stretches. All right. The purpose of this is very simple. It's going to be to, um, you know, and, 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 and by the way, I'm not going to write it down because I think it's going to be too long. I'm just going to write down kind of the few things that I think are, are really important to, uh, to remember. Um, for the rest, I'm just going to say it out loud. I think it will save us some time, but I will make sure to draw it out. Okay. I think that's what we're going to do just so that we're not here all day. So the purpose of this activity is going to be to be, uh, to get warm. Okay. To warm up the body. Um, and okay. Um, by doing the dy dynamic stretches and moving around, but also, um, getting some touches and getting some uh, sets in. Okay, so we're gonna use our hands so that we also warm up our hands and uh, get reminded of what we've worked on so far with our setting right at the beginning of the practice, okay? The time of the activity is gonna be about, uh, like everything combined is gonna be about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna put uh, 20 minutes in there. And as you can see, like 20 minutes out of 90 minutes is quite a bit of time for your warm up, but it, it's kind of necessary when you start your practice, um, you know, to get the athletes warm and ready to go. So that's why I really like to use that time to be doing some work as well with the ball okay? and not just kind of running around. Um, I think you kind of hit two birds with one stone, right? So over here is not so much um, kind of skills variation and cues. We're going to do a little bit of everything. I want to get into what the drill is going to look like. So let me get set up here. 
Uh, okay. And I'm going to zoom in this way. Okay. I hope this works. It's like acting up. Okay. So the way we do this is probably um, split the cord. Okay. So probably split the cord in half right here. Then, um, so we do a two, a two on two, two on two uh, king's cord. So I'd have like the winners on this side, and then I'd have two players on this side, and then two players waiting in the back here. Okay. These players have the ball, and they initiate the play. Okay. And if they win the point, right, uh, they move on to the other side. Okay. So if this team here wins a point, they move on to this side. And if this team here wins, they move on to this side. Now, whoever loses the point, gets back to the end of the line. But as they get back to the end of the line, um, you know, they have a series of uh, dynamic stretches to do, things such as lunges, uh, ground sweeps, uh, they could do some high knees, uh, butt kicks, all these types of things, shuffle, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you would have obviously a list of, uh, of those, those activities. I would probably write them uh, on the whiteboard and have the players Kind of just read, okay, well, I've already done this. Let's do the next one, right? So no matter who uh, loses the point, they would get to, you know, this point here at the net, um, and then they would just execute their um, dynamic stretches all the way back until they get back in line to play the next one, right? So that's kind of how the, the drill works for the warm-up. Now, in terms of the game itself, it's smash ball. So I would probably keep my net low. All right, and then do a uh, two-person smash ball. I'm going to write down here in the description. Have my text here. Okay, so two-player smash ball. We're going to go. Um, we're going to go. Uh, we're going to play with no bounce. No bounce. So direct catch of the ball. So um, the first contact can be a catch. Second contact needs to be um, a set, but it can be a direct set to the player so they can put it over or a catch and set. Okay, so that would be essentially, um, if I do it on this court right here beside it, I'm just going to go boom. Okay. If I do it on the court beside it, that would mean that if I have my players right here and this player here catches the ball, this player would be moving to the net. Okay. As soon as they catch the ball, they would be tossing the ball to this player. And now this player here, who is, let's say, player one and player two. Player one who's setting now would have the choice to set the ball direct, okay, if they're comfortable with it, or they could catch the ball, toss it themselves, set it up, and then have an, an X, uh, I guess like a player two would come in and then put the ball over with an attack, um, uh, preferably an attack, so that they can start like warming up, warming up, uh, warming up their shoulders, um, and so on. Now, if they're 12 of you and they're very inexperienced, then you could also have the attacker catch the ball and throw it, right? At this point, we just want the athletes to be um, kind of moving around while they're playing smash ball like this. They're reading the play as the ball comes over to their side. They have to you know, catch the ball before it touches the floor. And then they also understand the concept of throwing the ball to the net, having the ball being set along the net, and then somehow putting the ball over the net again. Okay, so that would depend on where we're at uh, at this point in the season, whether, uh, you know, we would have done this drill before. And so I would know exactly kind of where the athletes are. But we would play this for, um, you know, quite a bit. We would probably play this for, um, you know, anywhere between 
uh, 10 and 15 minutes. And then, okay, and, and the thing here is I don't wanna use an entire uh, box for the speed stuff, but if you remember, once we go here, right, we wanna work on our five minute of speed max at the end of the warm up before we go get some water. So I'm just gonna kind of add it um, underneath here, okay, as, a, as an extra line. I could probably modify this section of my um, practice plan to have a spot for, for speed. But essentially, what I'm going to do, okay, I can probably draw it on this side here, is I'm going to write it down here. So for speed, I guess I could write it in here. That would be a good place to write it down. We're going to write, um, uh, speed work, warm up speed work. What we're going to do is um, we're going to be at, we're going to do a bunch of sprints. Okay. So we're going to do um, line sprints and they are going to be about uh, six to 10 seconds in length. So I'm going to have to make sure that whatever sequence I ask my players to do is going to be about six to 10 seconds. It's going to be max speed. And then we're going to do active recovery, doing uh, setting ball against the wall. And what we're going to do is we're going to do set to self and set to wall. Okay? And this is, a, this is something that I really like for uh, working on speed because, again, when you work on speed, you've got to consider the time that you're doing your max speed work and then the time that you're spending uh, recovering. And obviously we have limited time and I don't want my athletes sitting, you know, just for a minute, not doing anything. Okay. So what we can do is we can have our athletes get on the line. All right. Oh, that's not what, okay. We can get them like on the line here. We can have a couple of, uh, you know, a few lines back to back. And then they would go and do, let's say, uh, middle line, attack line, sprint to the end. Okay, so it would last about six to 10 seconds. It's real quick, they go full speed, and then they have to recover for a minute. I would probably have them have a ball, you know, against the wall somewhere around the gym. And once they're done their, their, their sprint, they would go grab their ball, and then they would essentially set the ball to themselves and then set to the wall and then set to themselves and then set to the wall and try to do this continuously just to kind of, you know, practice um, the motion and the hands. And I would probably at this point, um, you know, reiterate um, the key teaching point that, you know, we need to include here for uh, our drill because we're going to want them to do it uh, in, in our warm up. Uh, but it would be um, some of the teaching points that we've already worked on. Okay, so at this point, I have not introduced a new teaching point. Okay, so that's why I'm not including one here, just because we don't necessarily know which ones, uh, you know, we worked on before. But whatever you worked on before, this could be something you include here in terms of um, remembering, okay, uh, like the kind of maintenance of, of, of the stuff that you've already worked on. Okay, um, so that's what you put here, right? So then after they've done about a minute of those setting, that setting, they would come back do another sprint and you would do that three times. Okay, just, just short, but you know, we've done our five minutes of, of, of max speed work and now we're ready to go into our session, our, our session. All right, so we've done our ball warm up, they've stretched, they've done this practice here and then we move on to our first activity, All right? Um, I see a question, let me just get to it. Yeah, so I assume I assume I'm assuming I have one court, Calvin. That's correct. Okay, so I drew on two courts, but these two activities would happen back to back. So first would be this on the one court, and then once we're done this, then we would do our sprints. Okay, so I'm assuming that most teams at four on four only have access to one court. Um, so okay, so now we've done our 20 minutes warm up. We're ready to go. Um, we're gonna want to focus on our skill. So our skill is setting. I know that 
um, I'm going to want to do some acquisition. Okay, we have some very young athletes. They need to learn everything. There's a lot of stuff we need to introduce to them. So let's do um, what would also be known um, as part of the development coach workshop and NCCP as a method one drill. All right. So I'm just going to write it down here for um, you guys. So I'll probably write down M1 drill. So that would be a drill. The characteristics of this type of drill, of, of this type of acquisition drill, is there's going to be a lot of um, opportunities to do the repetitions, okay, lots of repetitions of the skill. Uh, athletes are kind of, they can do it on their own time. There's no rush. Okay, They can go at their own pace. And they uh, also have opportunities for feedback. And we're going to try to give athletes an opportunity to give each other some feedback as well. All right, in that uh, method one drill. So the drill is very, it's gonna be very simple. It's gonna be kind of a pass, uh, sorry, a set 10 drill, okay, very simple. And my goal for this one is going to be uh, improve, squaring up the target. And like we said in our in the top here, and using legs and arms to push. So now I have my two key teaching points as part of the objective of my drill. Right? The time is probably going to be around 20 minutes again. Okay. Uh, just because we're going to do a bunch of sets of this activity. Okay. Skill variations. Um, again, just saving some time here. We're going to be working on setting. That's going to be the, the pretty much the only skill because that's the purpose of my, that's the main priority of my, uh, of my, of my drill, sorry, my practice, according to my practice, uh, seasonal plan. And we're doing like a very simple acquisition drill where it's going to be blocked with athletes tossing and one athlete, you know, setting the ball and just executing that over and over again. Right. In terms of the cues and the decision. Uh, because it's a method one drill and it's, it's very simple, the key cues and decisions are also very simple. Okay, so here we're talking about stuff such as um, um, like body position in relation to the ball. Okay, so, you know, do they need to move a little bit to set the ball or not? And then body position in relation to target okay so they're going to have to assess right because we want them to be squared they're going to have to assess where they are in space compared to the ball compared to the target right where does the ball come from where do i have to put the ball all right and this is kind of this is going to be part of their decision okay so they're going to assess where they are and then after that and where the ball is and then they're going to have to make some decisions and the decision is going to be very simple again it's not like they have to choose between two places to set the ball, but they have to make very, very basic decisions and interpretations about, you know, where is the ball coming from? And then where do I set the ball? And this is how like, they already know where to set the ball, but we kind of asked the question in terms of deciding like how much they need to rotate. Okay, where do I set the ball? So I guess I could write it here. How much um, do I rotate to be squared? Right? The other thing would be how much arms and legs to use to reach the target. All right? So those would be kind of our decision um, for our drill. So very simple stuff. Again, it's not as complicated as when we are you know working with older older athletes and they have all sorts of options very basic stuff but still things that the athletes at this younger level need to work on all right once i've done this then i'm going to go into my drill now i'm going to write it down i think that'll be the easiest way for me to um to explain it oops uh, Okay, so this drill is going to be very simple. I'm going to have 
I'm gonna split my court again in like pretty much in four. All right, so I'm gonna have four groups. I have 12 athletes. So I'm gonna uh, put them in groups of three, okay? So I'm going to have a player here. Oh, I just wanna use this one actually. I'm gonna have a player here, I have my setter here, and then I'm gonna have a target here, okay? And I'm gonna have the same thing on the side, right? And in each square. I'm gonna write that, I'm not gonna write all of them down, but you get the idea. There's one group of three in each of those uh, four corners. And the way the drill works is this player here, so X is gonna to toss the ball to setter, who is going to set the ball to the target, okay? So that's a very basic idea. Depending on the skill of the, the, the players, uh, I may or may not uh, put, you know, ask the setter to start in a different position just to challenge him a little bit more. But at this point, we're expecting the setter to face where the ball is coming from. So face X. And then when the ball comes to them, they're going to turn to face the target, square up, use their legs and arms to set the ball all the way up. All right. We're going to obviously define what that, uh, the nice set and what a successful execution looks like. And then we're going to get into the drill. Okay, so they're going to do this. That's that's how drill works. Okay, and then eventually all of the players kind of rotate so that everybody goes to every position. Right, so very very simple stuff. In terms of the description, okay, I've said it. Okay, I've described the drill and I drew it here. Very simple execution criteria. This is what I want to include in here. Okay, so at this point, oops. Did you see that? All this stuff moved. That's weird. Okay. Well, sorry for that. I don't actually know how to fix that. Um, because it doesn't appear like this here. Mm -mm. Oh, let's move it again. Weird. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> again, technology. So our execution criteria for this is going to be, um, we're going to want to do uh, 10 reps. Okay. And we're going to want to do um, three sets. Uh, we have 20 minutes, right? So 10, 10, 10, 10. It's probably going to take... Uh, Ten, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we can do three sets, and then if they have time, they can do uh, they can do more. They can do more um, because we have time. Okay. So the three sets there's going to be. Um, and by the way, and I'm not talking about three sets. So it's like ten repetitions of a set, and three sets of ten repetitions. Okay. And they're going to be one. Um, I guess I'm going to call them sequence so that we don't confuse it with an actual set okay one sequence uh, setting to uh, four one sequence setting to towards two okay and then let's have uh, so then this way they're going to face you know the other way and then one sequence alternating all right so we're going to do this here my key teaching points are going to be these one here. Okay. So it's probably going to be um, here. And it's going to be square up, target, and I'll be more precise, but we'll say, um, you know, chest looking at target. Okay. Just to kind of create an image there for our players. And then I want to use legs and arms. And I have uh, usually an image that I use with young players where I compare their body to a spring that you compress and then, you know, decompress and it extends into the ball to create the power. So I'm probably going to use like, you know, the word spring, um, spring up or something like that as a teaching point um, in terms of something that I'm going to repeat. For the athletes so that you can set okay now um at this point in time i want to mention a cycle 
psychophysical qualities. Okay. So if I go back to this here, remember that I had self-awareness and self-evaluation are two skills that we want to work on with our team this year. Okay. So in self-evaluation, I look at, you know, regularly ask players to assess their performance in practice and in games. Okay. And I think this is a great opportunity to include something here where, let me see if I have a text here. Yeah. Where as part of this drill, I can ask the players, you know, to players say yes, no, um, whether they were squared to target or not. Okay. So maybe I just ask that to the players and then um, as I coach and walk around, I get a better understanding of how they you know, feel their body and how they actually understand their body moving in space and where their shoulders are facing, right? If, if they're not facing the target and they're saying, yeah, I was facing the target, then I know they don't understand. And then we can have that conversation when they get off you know, to uh, another position, right? And, and that just helps me with my coaching. And the players can then also start helping each other, right? Because then as they get comfortable with each other, the players can say, well, you said yes, but actually I don't agree or something like that, right? Um, so I really like that piece and it helps us work on that self-evaluation piece, okay? So I'm gonna include that in there. So that's that, okay? So now I have, um, you know, my first drill. I my warm up at my first drill, done a bunch of sets. Uh, they, and then they've done a bunch of repetitions and we were able to work on the skills. They perhaps had time to do another set, great. I know that they had a lot of reps, okay? So at that point, I'm gonna to wanna to do something that's a little bit uh, more complex. And I know the time is flying, so I'm just gonna go a little bit quicker here. But at this point, I wanna do setting again, because that's my priority, but I wanna do it in um, something that's gonna create a little bit more stress to the athletes in terms of cue reading and decision-making, and something that's gonna get closer to an actual game, all right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find an activity that will do that. Okay. So uh, it's here, I'm get disconnected. So, okay, just saving some time here. I'm going to look at, okay, how do I, how can I do this? And personally, with young players, um, I like to use small sided games uh, as much as possible. Right. I try to stick to block training uh, to, to the minimum and then do a lot of, that kind of skill work in a game environment. I think that learning by playing is a great way to do it. So I'm gonna do this part of the, of the practice where there's, you know, it's still basic, but there's a bit more reading to do as part of a little small sided game. So then what I'm gonna do is set up again because I've got all my players and I want them involved. I don't want them in a line. I want everyone involved as much as possible. I'm gonna split my cord in two again, all right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my players in groups of three. So where I have a setter and I have two passers on this side, two passers on this side and a setter. And I'll have the same thing on the other side of that red line. I realize that you can't see what I'm doing. Sorry, there you go. Okay, so I'm gonna split the cord in half and then uh, the three players on each side. And I'm gonna let them do all the work. So I don't wanna get involved as a coach. Because every time I, that as a coach, I take a rep and I do something that I'm taking a rep out of the, you know, from the players and they need all the reps. I don't need them. So I'm going to give them a ball and they can get started themselves. And the way it's going to work is um, this team, let's call them team number one and team number two. Team number one is going to send the ball to team number two. Okay. They're going to pass the ball. So one of the two players here, either player A or B is gonna pass the ball to the setter and the setter is gonna to have to set the ball. And now what we're gonna say is that for the first round, all right, the setter has to set the ball to the player who did not pass, all right? So this team sends the ball over, let's say A passed the ball, S has to set the ball to B. They have to figure out a way to find out where the ball comes from, 
now realize where their target is, right? So now they have to think on the fly about where they need to send the ball and they need to move their body and square up to that position in order to set the ball in that direction. See how now the cue reading and the decisions are a little bit more complicated in that than in the previous drill. And that's a purpose because we're working towards getting into a game situation. Um, so, you know, the fact that we already tell them that you have to make that decision simplifies it, but it's still a lot more complex than what they just had to do. Okay, so A passes the ball. Oops, I needed, needed that to be green. A passes the ball to the setter and setter now sets to B, okay? Now B is gonna take the ball and they're gonna set it over if they can. They, if that was all executed well, they're gonna set it over to this side. And the same thing happens. And we're gonna to try to make this continuous, okay? But we know they're 12 U, so they may be messing a lot and that's okay, all right? So they're gonna do this for as long as they can. If they missed on the first try, that's okay. Now we switch sides, okay? Uh, sorry, we do it again, okay? We do it again, and we're gonna do it again four times. Okay, so there's gonna be four times of that ball. Okay, so once we miss, we send it again. Then what's gonna happen is that this team, team two is gonna send the ball over to this team four times. Again, if the ball keeps going in play, they can finish it up. They can finish the rally and they can go as long as they can. That's just creates some more reps for them. And then once they've done four on each side, then everyone's gonna rotate on this side and then everyone's gonna rotate on this side, okay? Now, this is not what it would necessarily look like on my practice plan. I'm putting all those arrows so that I can explain to you what's going on. Um, but that essentially is what uh, the drill will be, okay? I see a question. Calvin, you wanna unmute? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Are they actually passing or are they catching and tossing? Well, that would be up to, I guess, you and your, your players. So um, if like you're, we're November 22nd, so perhaps now they're a bit more comfortable, so they're passing the ball. But if you're at a point where it's too complicated, just going to catch the ball would be great because then you're still working on them. You know, it's, it's a secondary objective, but your players are now reading the ball, getting behind, catching the ball. And that's probably a great step forward for them anyways. In, in, in order to get to a point where they can pass it, right? So um, the point of this drill and the objective here is that, you know, um, we're having the players and the setter because our priority is setting. Um, again, reading where the ball comes from and deciding where to go, right? Deciding like, how do I need to move in space so that I can face the person I'm supposed to set and set them the ball, okay? So we just upped the, the, the task in terms of curating and decision-making. Okay. And so they do this four times, rotate through. Once everybody's gone through four times, they do it again, okay? Now, this time, instead of setting the player who uh, did not pass the ball, we're asking them to set the player who did set the ball, all right? So if I was to quickly write this down just as a note, so everybody, it's clear, it would be first round set to non-passer, I guess. Second round, that's to passer, and that would be the um, the piece of um, the piece on 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 the key reading. All right, execution criteria. We go um, four balls per setter uh, side that rotates, and my key teaching points are going to be. Um, related to, again, they're gonna be very similar to what we did before in terms of squaring up, but we're probably gonna add a piece here about the reading, okay? So, um, and, and so that would be like something like, um, uh, like identify um, attacker early and maybe we ask the players to uh, call um, call the name of the attacker um, almost like I would say either before or as soon as possible after the past. I would even go all the way to say like maybe you could challenge them to call the name of the attacker before the person even passes the ball because they've already identified kind of where that ball was going to be passed, right? Uh, in terms of Psycho-physical quality, I think this is a great time for us. Oops. 
I'm just gonna grab this. I think it's a great time for us to work on uh, communication and then just calling the ball. Okay, we have that in our uh, season plan here. So I think we can add that piece here where we're asking the players to call the ball because now they're going to be two passers and they have to make that decision of who's going to pass the ball. It's a great opportunity to, uh, to add that in. So once we've done this and now we've um, gone a bit further now, you know, this is probably going to take us another 20 minutes. So if our warm up was 20 minutes, our first activity was 20 minutes and this one's 20 minutes, that means that we have half an hour left and in our, let me just put it here. Okay. And if we look at our practice plan, we wanted to have half an hour of competition. So now for the rest of my session, I'm going to be doing some four on four, okay, to prepare for a competition. So our four on four, the way it's going to look like is it's going to be a very basic four on four uh, activity, except, okay, so I'm just going to place my, my players. I'm going to have, um, let's say setter, and let's call them A, B, C, setter, A, B, C. And the way it's gonna work is the ball is gonna be initiated, okay, by a toss to the setter. So, um, I mean, we could do a serve and pass, and maybe we progress to that after, you know, and as a, as a variation after the first uh, 10 minutes of our game. But at the beginning, I want to make sure that we're going to have opportunities to set the ball. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm going to start by initiating the ball by a uh, pass. So it can be a coach that's going to be on this side, for example, or a coach could be just giving a ball to the, you know, the B player who then tosses the ball to the setter, who then sets to one of the two players to initiate the game. All right. And we're just going to play at this point. All right. We're going to have our, the rest of our players. On the side here, I'm probably going to split in terms of the rosters that I'm going to have at the event because I'm going to split my 12 players into rosters so we can have them already uh, get uh, used to playing with each other. The key to this drill, okay, and this game is, is going to be what we just said here. It's going to be how we initiate the ball. So what kind of situation do we create? Do we make sure that we have? Because we could be wanting to work on setting as part of our game but because of where our players are at, they never get that chance because there's never a good pass and so on. Um, the way we're going to start the game is going to be important because it may be the only time that we get the skill that we want to that we want to see. So this could be one. And then we could evolve to a free ball. We could evolve to a point where you know the ball is initiated from a coach here who sends a free ball to these players who then pass, and we are a bit more confident that um, actually. You know what? Forget what I said. Um, I just remembered that this is a uh, this is triple ball. So, in fact, I would actually probably scrap this plan in terms of having the ball initiated to setter because I know where I'm going to have the free ball here. I would probably include a serve so that we get ready for the the weekend and our tournament, and then have our two free balls. That's right. Just had a blank here. It's triple ball. Okay, so in triple ball, we already have the two free balls. So as part of our game, we're going to play the sequence. Yeah, let's just do that. We're going to play the sequence of a serve and then a free ball this way and then a free ball that way. So that's going to give everybody a chance to set. If we see it, that the, um, the passes are not there, then we can decide to then replace one of the free balls with a toss to the setter. Let's just do that. Okay. Now, what I wanted to say was that our... Um, Execution criteria is going to be what's the main, the most important thing here as part of this simulated play drill. Because this is what it is. So what we want to do for this game is make sure that we emphasize setting because it's been a priority the entire time. All right. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use our teaching points that we've done since the beginning of practice, and we're going to make them worth points. Okay. And if you remember looking at the seasonal plan. When we go here, we have this objective here. Okay, we have an objective of doing three contacts at all time. And we have one that's related to setting. And it's that we want to have our athletes hand setting as much as possible. Okay. So this is something that we want to work on as part of a seasonal plan, as part of our team. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up 
this game so that every rally is worth a point. Oops. Hello. Okay. Well, I'm going to do another text thing because it doesn't work. Okay. Every rally worth a point. Then I would have um, extra point or handset, and then extra point or handset. Uh, I guess not. Sorry, it's for uh, squared target. Okay. So we play a game. Okay, and every time someone wins a rally, the team get a point. Every time a setter, or it could be someone else who's also right in, in the middle of a rally, does a set with their hands, they would get an extra point. And if they were also square to target, then they will also get an extra point. So technically, a team can get three points in one single rally if they do all these things. Okay. And obviously, uh, you can have your players do this, but I suggest that at the young level, you probably do that yourself as coaches and you try to kind of slowly get your players to do it. Eventually, they'll be able to track their scores by themselves. They may be able to do it now, but it may just be faster if you keep track of that for now. And then at the end of the rally, just explain, hey, you know, do we have any extra points? Yes, there was. Here, where they were, and here's the score. Okay. Uh, and then you play, other than that, you play the game, you know, the normal way. So you go through the triple wall sequence and you just go through all of the players. And I would run this until everyone's gone through and see how much time is left. And if you have time to, go and play another one, okay? At which point you could potentially um, include some new ways of scoring some points. But in terms of um, this one practice, because squared to the target was our main priority, we also had using the legs and arms, um, but that's the one that we're choosing for, for our game, right? We could choose arms and legs too, but I guess I just chose squared because I prefer it for now. Right, uh, but the idea is that you're uh, you're keeping track of the score. You're, you're scoring what you want to work on, right? Um. Okay, uh, Kevin, you raise your hand again. Again? Yeah. <clears throat> just a clarification. Just just curious for the scoring system. Is that just the end rally, or are you giving a point for every time? Let's say the ball goes over four times and the setters square twice in that rally. Yeah. Are you giving two points to each side yeah. or just the end point rally? Yeah, yeah, two points. Okay. So yeah, they, they could they could get a lot of points. Okay. So if the uh, ball goes over 50 times, they can get yeah. okay. 50 points. That's okay. uh that like it's it's tough. You know, have I'm to guessing. be really focused as a coach. You have to be really focused as a coach to keep track of that. Um I know that uh, I mean I've been doing this for a while and uh and I feel pretty comfortable with this. Uh, if you want to start with just one extra point, then, you know, do that. And then as you get more comfortable with keeping track of everything, then, you know, you can add some. Um, but I know that, you know, uh, for me in this practice, I would I would put at least two extra points because it's not just that I want to encourage, the, you know, it gets to be square to target, but I want to remind them of our objective of studying with our hands in game, right? We, we've just done it, but it was in drills. Um, but now, you know, we're in a game situation and I want to make sure that they're reminded that, Hey, we want to, we want to keep working on using our hands. Right? And, and is this where you would, like yesterday you were talking about statting the, the free ball and the, remember what you were talking about, the 80%, 70% yeah. and you would begin statting that here also? There. Yeah. It would be in the game situation. Right. So once we get to that portion of the practice, um, now, you know, I would only do that if you have a uh, coaching staff you know, an assistant coach or a parent or someone else able to do this. Um, I would want to make sure to play the players are involved in the practice at this point. Uh, and, you know, paying attention to what's going on. And then you, you would need a coach also to keep track of points. And I don't think you can keep track of everything at once. So, but if you did have that staff available, uh, you could do it. Um, I probably wouldn't do it every single practice because, you know, you're going to have some variation practice to practice, but maybe you do it like once a month. Um, I like doing it around the, the events and the tournaments anyways. Uh, but if you wanted to see if there was a difference between practice and, 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 and games, that would be a good way to do it, a good time to do it. 
<clears throat> and then, yeah, so that would be our practice. And then we'd be done. We'd have our uh, hour and a half. I would probably end up five minutes early so that we can uh, you know, cool down. And then we'd be going off for um, for the day and then ready for, for our, week, uh, our weekend competition. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, I realized that time flew. And again, I said like it was a first, it's the first time I do this. So I'll have to uh, adjust for the next sessions and make sure that I can maybe fill out as many of these things as possible. Maybe I'll pre-fill out some of them. Um, yeah, so, but no, it was nice. Uh, it was nice to do this with you guys. Are there any questions? Cause I don't want to hold anyone back any longer. Is there any questions about kind of that process of, you know, using the seasonal plan to make sure that we address every single items, you know, in that row, sorry, in that column. And then the process of kind of building up a practice from, you know, warm up to a, an acquisition drill to including a bit more curating to then getting into some sort of play. Uh, okay, question from uh, Ileana. Most resources have U12, U, U11, U12 at 90 minutes per practice. You have the gym for two hours. Would you suggest keeping it at 90 minutes? Um, that's a good question. Not necessarily. Uh, the reason why is, you know, if you have two hours, you probably have, it probably gives you some time to do other things, right? 90 minutes is very short. And you're going to find that running a practice like I've shown that I just did with you guys is going to um, your practice, your 90 minutes is going to go by really fast. You have to be quite organized to run everything, you know, uh, in, in the one session. Um, so if you have two hours, you can do all of this in two hours and then you're not so rushed and you can take more time to give feedback to your athletes, perhaps. Uh, perhaps you can get a, a few more repetitions. Listen, at the end of the day, what LTD says is, you know, that at that age, 90 minutes is good for, you know, just attention span and also considering other sports that these athletes must be doing, you know, because it's considered that at that age, they're probably practicing more than one sport. Um, so that's what it says. So, you know, I think you can use your judgment. Like, I don't think there's anything bad in, or anything wrong in, in doing a two hour session. I would just find a way to use that time in, the, in a way that makes sense, in a way that doesn't uh, tire and or fatigue my athletes more than they should be tired. And in a way that's gonna serve our objectives of getting wherever at the, end of the, at the end of the season, right? That's probably what I would do. So I don't think there's like a yes or no black or white answer to this question. So. Yeah, journal reflection time would be great you know, a little relaxation. There's actually um, some um, some really cool stuff. I will share a podcast with you and whoever watches this recording in the future. Uh, it's called the Huberman Lab. I'll write it down here. Just look it up, Huberman Lab podcast. And they ha he has a session on uh, skill acquisition. And uh, apparently research has shown that 10 minutes of non-sleep deprived uh, relaxation uh, at the end of a bout of skill learning can uh, have a significant effect on, on that skill learning and the skill acquisition in terms of uh, the brain and the, and the nervous system. So what that means is that, uh, and I kind of actually, I listened to this very recently. I haven't had a chance to try it, but um, it sounds like pretty decent research. And so I want to eventually try including this type of like 10 minute, um, kind of relaxation at the end of a session. Um, cause apparently it's what you need to do in order to accelerate scale acquisition. So very interesting stuff. You can listen to the podcast and, you know, see, um, what I mean to you, but if you have extra time, it'd be a great way to use it. Um, yeah, Jerry, great, great um, comment and suggestion here to kind of use some time at the end of your session to uh, recap, right? What did you learn today and everything? I know that 
when I coach, I like to do that outside of the gym because gym time is so precious. I like to use the gym time that I have to be on court. So I'll often ask players to get ready to go beforehand and to kind of warm up if they can, either outside or in the hallway. I know these days it's not as easy with COVID, but anyways, uh, I'd li I like to ask that to, to, you know, from the players. And then I also would uh, talk to the players outside of the gym when we're done practice. Uh, again, just to try to maximize uh, gym time and it can also do their work, their, their cool down, um, you know, out, outside of the gym. So, but anyways. Hi, uh, LP, I have a question. Yeah, for sure. Um, is peaking less important or less of an emphasis on younger kids than older kids? Like when you do your practice plan and, you know, you peak for big tournaments, you know, for young kids, 12 and 13, um, is it less important um, or you put same, uh, the same emphasis on, on peaking, on training? Um, can you overtrain 12 year olds, 11 year olds, 12 year olds? Um, I don't know if you understand my question. Yeah, well, for sure. I think, I, I think you can definitely overtrain them. Um, yes. And like, I think they're, you know, I think everyone has experienced this, like younger kids are, you know, they're not as heavy. They're not as like big muscularly, you know, like their, their muscular mass is not as big. They don't tend to have the same type of like chronic injuries that older athletes may have and that we yeah. see like 16 17 18 year athletes yeah um but they can still they can still get um they can still get tired uh they can still get hurt they can still um get tired mentally right okay. um, like i think i think sometimes with the young ones uh, you know if you don't find a way to also make your practices fun and engaging you can kind of burn them out in terms of them not having fun anymore yeah. um, so those are all things you need to consider but um, my answer to your you know, question in terms of peaking is, uh, yes, I, I would consider peaking all the time and no matter, no matter, um, the level of the athletes Okay. for two reasons. Um, one is you can, uh, with the little ones, you can, you can build excitement, right? You can, yeah. you can work with them so that you get to an event and they feel on fire, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then learning, you know, learning how to do that, I think is a, is a great process. And then the other thing is for me, just as a coach, it, like if, if one year I'm going to be coaching a 12 year team, uh, but I know I'm going to coach them in the future too, or next year I'm going to be moving back to an older team where peaking is going to be, um, you know, very important. Well, I don't want to lose that skill. Right. Like I, I want to, I want that to be part of like my every day and every year coaching, no matter who I coach. Cause I want to keep thinking about that, thinking about how much I'm doing with the athletes, like how much load they have, how much they jump, how tired they are. You know, I want to keep thinking about that. Now, is it going to have a very big impact on their physical readiness? Probably not at that age. Okay. But I would, I would keep thinking about it. Um, okay. Thank you. Again, like, like, and that's assuming that you, you you stay within kind of the parameters of LTD, right? So if you were telling me that with your 12-year team, you train five days a week, then I would say, yeah, absolutely. Like, you're going to get them tired. You yeah. can definitely overtrain them. So then peaking would be crucial. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, thanks for everyone who joined um, on a, uh, you know, in the middle of the day. That was a good experience for me. I look forward to do it again. And if you have any questions, you can always uh, email me at uh, lpmainville at ontariovolleyball.org.